John Niehaus, Director of Program Development for the National Association of Flight Instructors. And I'd like to welcome you to this edition to the NAFI Briefing Room, the online video series where we pick a topic, we talk about it, and we see whether you guys agree with us or not. Um, so today's topic is something we call multi-talk. It's multi-engine flight instruction. And uh, specifically, what we want to talk about is accident avoidance in multi-engine airplanes. I've, uh, I've gathered together or assembled, if you will, a uh, group of uh, individuals who are experts in this area of discussion. And uh, we'll start uh, just kind of to my left here on my screen. Um, we have Gary Reeves. Gary is a CFII, an MEI. He's a current NAFI master instructor. He's known internationally as GPS or the guy in the pink shirt. He also is uh, the recipient of the 2019 National CFI of the Year and owner of PilotSafety.org. Gary, welcome. Hey, John. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me again. Next, I have Nick Frisch. Nick is a four-time uh, NAFI Master Instructor, CFII, MEI, and also Beach Factory Instructor, and also spent time as an instructor for Flight Safety International. Nick, welcome. Thank you very much, John. And finally, I welcome back Brian Schiff, Captain Brian Schiff. He is a NAFI board member, CFII, MEI, and uh, a pilot captain for a major airline. Brian, welcome. Thanks. Glad to be here. So I know that uh, there's some opinions here that we need to talk about and get to, and I'm going to throw it straight to uh, to Nick, and uh, let's let's talk act accident, accident avoidance. All right, John. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I guess most instructors would agree that a large part of the goal of training is accident avoidance. It's that simple. Uh, you know, if you could guarantee that somebody could go out and fly an airplane and not have an accident, they probably wouldn't be, need to be trained. Uh, but the training really is about staying alive. It's about avoiding accidents. Um, and I think probably we would all agree on that. And I think a second point that we would all agree on is that fatal accidents deserve special attention. You know, because if there's a fatal accident, that's that. Uh, and if we can prevent those, it does everybody good. You know, not only the occupants of the airplane and the insurance companies, but the entire industry benefits when we can fly accident free. When I hear of a fatal accident as a pilot and a concerned pilot, concerned for my own life and safety, myself and my passengers, I am always wanting to hear what happened there. Is it something I could have done? Is it something I can learn from? So I think I absolutely agree with you on that, Nick, that, that we are very concerned with the fatal accidents because we don't want that to happen to us. Right. And absolutely. I think this is a very timely talk. Thanks to John and Mike and Brian for kind of organizing all this. Uh, with multi-engine fatalities uh, on the rise, there are so many insurance companies that have gone out of business that pilots are experiencing huge premium increases to the point that if we don't stop the fatal accidents in multi-engine airplanes, I think they're going to be uninsurable for the average GA pilot. Uh, the, the insurance companies are doubling or tripling premiums and doing everything they can to reduce more fatal accidents. So I think this is a very timely topic. So guys, let me ask you a quick question and, and maybe this is misguided, but if we get to the root of the problem, is multi-engine instruction more dangerous than single engine instruction? I think it encompasses higher risk because of certain factors, especially when it comes to asymmetric thrust and, and the skills involved. So I think there are higher risks, but they can be mitigated and need to be mitigated when they're not mitigated or taught the wrong way uh, incorrectly, then it is more dangerous. I think what Brian said is spot on. So I don't have anything to add. So um, then what do we do? How do we, how do we mitigate these things? What, what kind of ideas do you guys have? Um, and, and again, Nick, I know you've got some, so let's, uh, let's just jump into some of your thoughts. Okay. Well, so what I'll do is, is kind of go through my logic chain uh, and we can agree or disagree and discuss the individual points uh, as I go through the logic chain. And then, you know, at the end, we'll come to the conclusion that maybe we should do things differently or maybe not. Uh, so, so here we go. Um, we believe that training is 
primarily aimed at accident avoidance. And we also believe that fatal accidents deserve special attention. The AOPA or Safety Foundation printed a document a while back, and it, I do mean a while back, uh, that said that 80% of the multi-engine accidents and 87% of the fatal engine out accidents in twin engine airplanes were loss of control accidents. So that's a big number, 87% of the fatal accidents in twins with an, with an engine out. These were this specifically engine out emergency type of accidents or engine out training accidents, but all of them were loss of control accidents. So if we could get rid of the loss of control accidents, we could eliminate 87% of the fatal accidents in twin engine airplanes. To me, that's a huge big number. Yeah, so, Nick, you know, I actually, I have a question on the very first thing you said, and it's, it's one of my biggest concerns. You said, uh, we all agree, and I think the four of us on this panel absolutely agree, uh, that training is based on accident avoidance. Unfortunately, I don't think that's always true. Um, I think a lot of instructors, good instructors, uh, actually base their training on passing a check ride, which is not always the same thing. Wow, that's such a very good point, and, and uh, I completely agree with you. I'll agree with Gary as well, because I find students that want to know what they need to do to pass the check ride. They're not concerned about safety. I like to go above and beyond, as I would imagine the two of you do as well, in teaching <clears throat> what you need to survive as a pilot. If you do that, you're going to pass the check ride. Uh, the other thing is I get a lot of people come to me wanting flight reviews. I seem to do more of that than taking someone from the ground up. And for example, recently I had a, a a pilot come to me wanting a flight review. He owns a Baron, but wanted me to rent a 172 so we could do his flight review. And I absolutely flat out refused. I said, no, you fly that Baron every day. That's all you ever do. We need to go up and practice some multi-engine procedures. And I asked him flat out, when's the last time you practiced an engine out procedure? He says, I haven't done an engine out practice since I got my multi-engine rating 15 years ago. Mm. And I said, that's, that's a crime. You're going to kill yourself. And I won't sign you off in a single engine airplane. So what do you guys think of that? I love you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I think uh, part of the problem here that we're having is that once you get your multi-engine rating, there is absolutely zero requirement to ever practice engine out maneuvers. And the pilots who don't ever do it, I think, are the ones killing themselves. Bingo. Right. And, okay. and just I would add to that, though, that the training that they got when they got their multi-engine rating might have been inadequate or or worse yet incorrect fair okay yeah, so absolutely all right john so going back to the uh the logic chain um I'll, I'll make another statement and we'll see if we disagree with that uh and that is that piston twins which is mostly what we're talking about uh can be controlled with an engine out with the prop windmilling in any phase of flight, the, air, the aircraft can be controlled. Does everybody agree with that? With the proper, I'd agree. Yeah. With, yeah, with, with the proper controls. Uh, with the proper control inputs, but we agree that the aircraft can be controlled. There's no such thing as a bad twin, a wicked twin, you know, a twin that comes and kicks your uh, uh, <laughs> butt. That suddenly, inexplicably becomes uncontrollable. I, I Airplanes think that, behave with the laws of physics and every twin is controllable in any phase of flight with a power loss on one engine if the pilot applies the proper inputs. I agree that, is, if that if that rudder has enough leverage, i.e. airspeed and power, and <laughs> then I think it can be controlled. Any twin can be controlled in the scenario you described. Some are easier than others. Yes. Okay, great. So now we'll go on. If the twin can be controlled, if the airplane is not the problem, then I think we could say that all of loss of control accidents are avoidable. Uh, except for an unusual mechanical failure. Uh, I, I think we can uh, more so in preventing what takes you up to loss of control than recovering from a loss of control. And I'm not gonna 
agree with a blanket statement either. I think there are circumstances beyond which, you know, that we can think of right now that something could happen. There are possibilities. You know, people who say always and never are usually wrong. <laughs> My kids have heard me say that thousands of times. And, and I don't want to put a blanket statement because there may be scenarios uh, where, example, for example, some airplane may be certified with a VMC based on auto feather. And if the auto feather system fails, now you've got, and I know that you said you piston, uh, so you qualified that. Uh, so maybe I'm talking about turboprop and you're talking about piston. But I think there are scenarios possible where uh, there may be nothing you can do. Okay, I'm not familiar with any such scenario. No, I, I will grant you that my experience is not universal. But I did teach the King Air 200 for the Beach Factory. It has auto feather, it has rudder boost. But even if auto feather is not selected and rudder boost is not working, um, the airplane is still controllable. With enough airspeed, I would agree with you. Okay, so there we have it. All right, so uh, any, anybody else you know, have any comments about the notion that the airplane itself is controllable? I think there's a certain period of time where there's a risk factor uh, on takeoff. There's a short period of time while you're building that airspeed where you're going to have some problems. Uh, it may or may not be recoverable. Okay. So I'm of the opinion that any engine failure on takeoff is recoverable. Control is possible in any phase of flight with a multi-engine airplane. That's, that's my opinion. And, and, and so as we go on through this, maybe we can, uh, make, maybe we can come back and touch base to that again. And what okay. if you've got a mountain like, or trees or an obstacle in front of you? Would you maintain the same? Um, I guess I would say that the, the airplane is controllable, which is the point that we were establishing here, okay. is that these loss of control accidents are not the fault of the airplane. So it's Why a question... I would is the airplane killing the pilot or the pilot killing the airplane and themselves in the process? By and large, most of the time, and I would say a greater portion, if not in the upper 90s, it's the pilot, not the airplane. So if we can avoid those, then we've got a, a huge, big leap forward in accident avoidance, which would be great. Okay, so uh, loss of control accidents and twins with engine outs are avoidable. Agreed. All to do is control the airplane. Yes. Which really leads us to the question of why don't pilots control the airplane properly with an engine out? Lack of proficiency. I think it, yeah, I think it goes back to Brian's point, uh, a lack of training. Uh, insurance minimums are one thing, passing a multi-engine check ride is one thing, but I think it's a lack of constant and high level training and not nearly enough use of simulators is, is one of my big key points. Because as a master instructor, there's, there's nobody here on the panel that can successfully simulate a engine failure at 50 feet off the deck at maximum gross weight in the mountains at night. That's, it's not safe to possibly try and replicate that in an airplane. And that's one of the biggest advantages of simulators is you can create things that you just can't replicate in real life. Gary, can I say just one thing? Sure. That was beautiful. <laughs> I agree with you. We're all in agreement on that. In fact, I'm here in a hotel room because I'm doing my simulator training for the airline. And I did a, an engine failure that no one would dream of doing uh, in the real airplane. I just did it last night. I'm going to be doing more of those tonight, uh, losing an engine right at the most critical point and, and having to control it. So if you have the means and availability, and I believe everybody needs to try to make that happen, uh, the means and availability to go fly a simulator uh, to get some of that training, and, and it should be regular. In fact, I will go so far as to say, and I think uh, um, uh, Gary, you wanted to hide behind John at one point when you threw this out there, but I, I would go so far as to say that it needs to be regulated re proficiency training in multi-engine airplanes, uh, a regular recurrent program. Well, I, the good news is, is the insurance companies are doing that for you. 
Uh, I ab- absolutely, I, I think we need a higher level of training and retraining. Uh, kind of an interesting story is uh, I went to Australia last year to do some mastering IFR training and found out some interesting things. They actually have to do an IPC with an examiner every 12 months to maintain instrument currency. And I'm a huge fan of more training. Uh, so like you were telling the story about how you wouldn't sign the guy off in the Baron Retina 172. I, I have a very similar story. I was training a really great guy, very personable, very good pilot. He owns a Cessna Crusader, uh, a 303. And I was doing a three-day mastering IFR program. And I said on the last day, okay, we need to do a single engine approach. And he goes, well, I don't want to do that. And I'm like, well, it's, I'm just going to simulate a shutdown. He goes, well, no, that's hard on the airplane. I'm like, it, it's not, it's, it's in chapter four. It's, it's a normal procedure. No, none of my other instructors ever want me to do that. Well, what do you mean? And he hadn't practiced any single engine work in over 10 years. And I did the same thing. I'm like, well, you've already paid me for the three days. No givesy backsy, no refunds. I'm not going to sign your flight review. And I'm not going to sign your IPC without a single engine approach. And we went back and forth. He finally agreed to do it. And I, and I told him, Brian, Nick, John, I said, okay, I'm now going to pull the right engine. My hand is on the right throttle. I'm pulling the right throttle back. Within 30 seconds, he lost two or 3,000 feet and was 90 degrees off course. Wow. He had no control over that aircraft at all. So what happened to the previous 10 years of flight instructors? Well, the problem is, is all the flight instructors he hired that were local were really nice people and they were probably good instructors. None of them had crusader experience and they were all afraid to practice single engine work themselves. And because they were afraid to do it, he didn't do it. And and I absolutely, I told him very bluntly, the same thing, you know, you said, Brian, you're absolutely a dead man. You're going to kill your whole family if this happens for real, unless you get back on a serious training regimen. Right. Good for you. I, I kudos for that. And that's what has to happen. I think more instructors need to be taking that stance and maybe, uh, we need to push that a little bit harder. Uh, I think that when, uh, for example, when you fly on the airlines as a passenger, you're afforded the highest degree of care by regulation. And therefore, I have to go practice these engine failures every year. And every year, I realize I'm glad I'm here because I'm honing these skills back. I'm sharpening them again. Just like a dull pencil, the more you use it, it gets dull. And I come back here, and we get sharpened up again. And my skills are, are reset. And that applies to general aviation as well. Uh, pilots need to practice that, get that rudder worked down and work with asymmetric thrust and learn how to control that airplane. Like Nick said, learning how to control the airplane in that scenario, you're going to be fine. The airplane can do it. It's certified to be able to do it. Right. And I, you know, that takes us right back to 87% of the fatal accidents being loss of control accidents. The airplane is controllable. So like you were saying, Brian, you know, the pilot really needs to make control of the aircraft the first priority. Uh, and I would submit to you that that's not always what is taught to people in multi-engine training and that there could be adjustments to multi-engine training made that would improve the survivability of pilots. You know, obviously regular recurrent training, I'm a huge believer in that. Um, but I also believe in primacy uh, and a primacy is done correctly then it can be hugely helpful in accident avoidance with something like an engine out emergency. So um, I'm of the belief that multi-engine training should address engine out emergencies in all phases and conditions of flight, which is to say a phase of flight might be takeoff, climb, cruise, descent, approach, level off at MDA, um, on the glide slope, on a precision approach, initiating a missed approach from any situation. Uh, engine out emergency should be practiced at night in IMC, low visibility conditions. And the current training that's done in multi-engine uh, uh, training, multi-engine rating training in particular, I don't believe really addresses that. But I wanna, I wanna hone in on a specific particular 
uh, kind of accident and, and situation that pilots find themselves in. And that has to do with asymmetric power stalls. So we talk a lot about VMC, you know, and the conditions that create VMC and what VMC looks like and how we can recreate the experience of VMC in the airplane. Um, but there's a certain reality here and, and that is that we don't talk that much or demonstrate asymmetrical power stalls. And there's a really good reason for that. You look in the manufacturer's instructions and it says, don't do this. There's a reason that you shouldn't do that. And that is because one wing stalls before the other in an asymmetric power situation when you have a windmilling propeller. So modern airplanes, twins included, are designed to stall from the wing route out. And as the airplane approaches stall speed, what happens is that there is an artificial relative wind created by the, the prop that is spinning. It's a big fan blowing across the wing. And so what happens is the side that has the windmilling propeller hits stall speed or stall angle of attack first. And when that happens, the airplane rolls over abruptly. So the University of Tennessee Space Institute did a study on the Model 58P Baron specifically, and they did it for the U.S. Forest Service. And what the conclusion that they came to is that if you do an asymmetric stall, power asymmetric stall in a barren, that the roll rate is about 60 degrees per second when the wing stalls. So 60 degrees per second is not recoverable. It's not controllable. Uh, Brian Moore, who's now a vice president of operations for flight safety, uh, when we were working together, he was doing a multi-engine rating training for a pilot in a barren, and they were going to do a VMC demo. And so they set up all the conditions uh, and when the time came for the recovery, the pilot, instead of pushing the nose down and pulling the throttle, pulled the nose up. Uh, the airplane stalled, it spun. It took Brian 3,500 feet to recover control of that airplane. And we're talking about a very experienced Baron instructor who was anticipating this problem. And it still took him 3,500 feet to recover. So uh, you can understand why an asymmetric power stall leads to a fatal accident. And when you read the accident reports, the word abruptly often shows up and that word abruptly you know, really addresses not VMC, but it really addresses asymmetric power stall. It's not a recoverable situation unless you have a lot of altitude. I agree that that is definitely uh, one that you wanna teach avoidance. And I think what we need to do is we need to keep them separate uh, in, in any ways we can do it to try to keep the gap between VMC and stall speed uh, as great as we can. You get VMC close to stall speed and now you're gonna, you're, you're begging for a problem like what you're describing and it's, it's almost irrecoverable. Sure, you're begging for a fatal training accident. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so, so I think we would agree that stall and VMC are close, close together. You might hit one before the other depending on the altitude. But the real one is, I agree that the real VMC is, and I think that there are ways of teaching it without getting close to the real red line, the, uh, the actual VMC. But you can teach really what a student, what a, what a student multi-engine pilot needs to know is that eventually he will run out of rudder if he's slowing down with asymmetric thrust. There will not be enough rudder to control the airplane. Do you have to take it all the way down to stall speed to teach that? No, you can pull an engine back uh, one at idle, one at full power, and start pulling the nose up, and, and, and he'll learn that I have to keep feeding more and more rudder as I slow down. Now you can say, okay, stop. Let's just simulate that you ran out of rudder, you're against the stop. But we're not really. This way we're way above stall speed. And don't move the rudder anymore and pull the nose up. And then you see a little bit of a yaw to one side and then lower it. You can teach that without actually getting down to the, the real red line. Yes, you can you know, by artificially creating conditions that are not what the pilot is necessarily going to encounter in the real world in the airplane, because there's an instructor there creating artificial conditions in order to practice something. So um, here's another statement, and, and uh, let's talk about this, that there is no operational advantage to operating a twin engine aircraft 
with a windmilling propeller below either VXSE or VSSE. So here's my statement. There's no operational advantage to operating a twin with a windmilling propeller below either VXSE or VSSE. Would you agree that that's true? I agree that, yes, that the lessons can be taught without operating below those speeds and a good instructor can get creative enough to do so. So yes, I would agree with that. How about you, Gary? Yeah, I, I think all of that's true. I think what's missing is the, uh, we may need to actually change the way check rides are done. I, I think it, it may be time to change what examiners are looking for uh, in that the classic VMC demo that, you know, everybody does a VMC demo on a multi-engine check ride. Well, Brian, you've been teaching for 35 years, right? Congratulations. How many times have you had your students do a VNE redline demo? <laughs> uh, I have only done that in some airplanes in an emergency descent scenario, but I have. Right, but, but, you, don't, but you don't take a private pilot out and say, okay, let's demonstrate uh, how to not make more than certain control movements at redline. You don't typically take a Skyhawk up to redline to do a redline demo, right? Not typically, no. Well, and so the VMC demo is, in my opinion, and it's kind of a controversial opinion that we've, we've talked about before, I don't know that the VMC demo is really what we should be getting people to train for. I think training people to stay well above VMC, uh, much in the same way that several years ago, and I don't know how long it's been, that we took spin demos out of the private pilot check ride because we had such a high fatality rate during training. So I'm wondering if the VMC demo is really the best thing to be training and testing for. I think that's a great question. And uh, I have an answer for you. No, the VMC demo should not be trained and tested other than maybe one time to show a pilot, yeah, okay, there's a situation where you can run out of rudder. And I, I tell you what, I'm going to make my case, and then we can go back and review the points, because I don't want to get lost on this. So I'll make my case, and then we can go back for discussion. Is that okay with everybody? Sure. Okay, so what I said was that initially here, a uh, previous point was that stall and VMC are very close together. And we all agreed that, yeah, you might reach stall before VMC or VMC before stall, but yes, they're close together. And then there's no advantage to operating the airplane below VXSE or VSSE. Nobody came up with an operational advantage. Okay, so I think we're agreed on that. The next thing I would say is that pilots are capable of doing what they're taught and what they're trained to do. And I believe that pilots are capable of doing what they're taught and what they are trained to do. If they're not capable of it, obviously, then you go back and do more training. If they're really not capable of it, then they don't belong in that particular airplane. So that's, uh, that's the next point. I will also say that under duress, in a high stress emergency situation, that pilots are most likely to revert to the procedures that they learned that have primacy or recency or frequency which is to say you know, that pilots are going to revert to their strongest training under duress uh, because that's what they do. Okay, so uh, it is my opinion that a pilot of a multi-engine airplane should be trained to never get slow, to never operate that airplane with the windmilling propeller below a speed that equals either VXSE, the best angle of climb, or VSSE, the safe engine, safe engine out emergency speed. So uh, a pilot should never allow the aircraft to get below the speed that they have chosen as their minimum speed for control of the airplane in all phases of operation. Because speed really is the key to controllability. And that's why we do that VMC demo 
is to demonstrate that, yeah, there's a speed at which you're going to lose control of the airplane. And I think my point here is that there's a speed at which you can lose control of the airplane, but the real problem is not VMC. The problem is asymmetric power stall. And when the airplane reaches asymmetric power stall, it's like flipping a switch. The airplane rolls over. It is uncontrollable. Maybe the pilot can recover from that spin, but I'm not going to say that the, the odds are in the favor of the pilot. Okay, so if the pilot flies the airplane at a safe speed where the airplane is completely controllable, and I'll repeat that for emphasis, if the pilot flies the airplane at a safe speed where the airplane is completely controllable, then all of the loss of control accidents can be avoided. It's as simple as that. Okay, so I'm gonna use an example here, sort of a, a verbal picture to, to illustrate the point. Let's suppose that you're gonna climb into an airplane with a pilot. That airplane is say um, Baron, as an example. You're going to sit sit in seat number five or number six, and there's going to be other passengers in the airplane plus the pilot. At the back of each headrest, there's a revolver, and that revolver is set to go off at a certain speed. When the airplane reaches a certain speed with the windmilling propeller, the revolver fires. Now the question is: Let's suppose that the revolver fires at uh, 75 knots indicated airspeed. You can pick your number. Let's suppose it's 75 knots. Now, the airplane takes off, you're sitting in the seat, and a power loss occurs at some point during that flight. Do you want the pilot to approach 75 knots airspeed? I'm guessing Hell no. no. <laughs> you don't want like to approach 75 knots airspeed because when it hits 75, everybody's dead. And that is what happens with an asymmetric power stall. It gets to a certain speed. The wing on the side of the windmilling propeller stalls. The airplane immediately rolls over with a rate of 60 to 90 degrees per second in the case of a Baron. And there's nothing anybody can do. You're along for the ride. It's just like a gun going off. So if you think of it that way, then the next thing you're going to do is say, well, you know, what I really want to train the pilot to do is never get that slow. One of my so favorite instructors, my flight instructor used to pound into my head that mind the, thy airspeed lest the ground shall rise and smite thee. <laughs> Bingo. I love it. Yeah. I think so, that's a perfect statement for this situation. So Nick, that actually, uh, your comment on primacy, uh, that brings up a challenge for me. Every multi-engine student I work with has been taught that if they're off the runway and flying, when an engine failure happens, that they should continue flying. I don't know if I agree with that. I disagree I think, I, I, I got to tell you, you know, there was a, when I owned a big flight school in Long Beach, a friend of mine also owned a flight school in Long Beach, and he routinely taught his multi-engine students that if you were, you know, below 100 or 200 feet, it was safer to pull the good engine back to maintain control and land straight ahead. An examiner disagreed, and they actually went not to court, but they went to the FISDO uh, mm -hmm. about it, and the FISDO ruled on the side of the examiner that no, if you're off the air, you should continue flying. Well, and that brings me another thing uh, that you said, Nick, is, you know, you should be able to go around. I don't know if we want to encourage that. I, I got to tell you, in a low IMC or, a, you know, IMC condition, is it really better to go around than to land long on the runway and while you're, you know, right side up, go off the runway into a chain link fence at 40 or 50 knots. I think landing long and going off the runway is a whole lot safer than a single engine go around. It is because they're not taught properly. Do you know the phase of flight that most 
uh, 20 years ago, a study was done in multi-engine accidents. Do you know what phase of flight most of the accidents happen? I would say takeoff. No, go around. They take off, they get it around, a cruise or whatever, they get there, they realize that they've, they've stayed too high or whatever because they're overcompensating, and then they've got to initiate a single engine go around. And that single engine go around, at least this was about 15, 20 years ago, was the most common phase of flight for a multi engine accident because of the massive changes in asymmetric thrust that happen and, and, and not being prepared, and to Nick's credit, not having enough airspeed all at the same time. And at, or altitude, and that phase of flight is where that's happening most often. So I don't think we should not teach it because that's where it's happening. I, need, I think I think go arounds need to be taught at a safe altitude, uh, and the, and the respect for the airspeed as well. Okay, so there, you know, there's a number of items that came up, um, and I guess I would say, you know, going back to the loss of control issue because that's the thing I'm most interested in. Uh, and Barry, you touched Brian, or you touched on that with the uh, with regards to go around. So, um, I guess I would say that when we're training pilots, one of the things that we want them to do is to avoid undesirable behavior. Okay, so I'll make that statement again. We want to train pilots to avoid undesirable behavior. In other words, if they're doing a crosswind takeoff, you want them to put the ailerons into the wind you would want them to avoid a situation where they put the ailerons the wrong direction. If you're teaching a precision approach, you want to avoid chasing needles. You know, whatever it is, you want to avoid undesirable behavior. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay. So what I would suggest then is that uh, getting slow in a twin with an engine out, particularly with a propeller windmilling, Getting slow is a hugely undesirable behavior because the slower you get, the closer you come to the revolvers going off. I agree. And do you, I don't know if you guys have seen the video Dan Greider made where he went around asking different pilots what maneuvering speed meant to them. And if you ask a professional jet pilot, he'll say, that's the slowest I can go. And if you ask a GA pilot, it means it's the fastest I can go for turbulence. Uh, of course, the slowest I can go for maneuvering is, you know, my flight controls need to have enough uh, leverage to overcome an asymmetry or, or, or to, to avoid a, to be above a stall if I turn and so on. So I think this minimum speed respect is very important uh, and we need to teach that respect for minimum airspeed and to maintain airspeed. So if you take off in a twin, climbing is not what you want to do. If you don't, I mean, if there's nothing in front of you, most of the time there isn't anything in front of you. Uh, maintaining a level of flight and getting that airspeed up is the most important part, I believe. So I think we're in agreement on that. We all agree that getting slow is going to lead to a loss of control. And that getting slow is potentially going to get us to the point where one wing stalls and the airplane becomes utterly uncontrollable. It's going to spin. It's going to crash. People are going to die. Getting slow is a huge problem. Okay, so that's my postulation, is getting slow is a huge problem because you are approaching the speed at which the switch flips, revolvers fire, and everybody's dead. I agree that a healthy respect for a slow airspeed is, is very important. And that's why a go-around may not necessarily be climbing. It's about getting, the, you're not going to land, and okay, we'll get away from that. But the airspeed needs to be uh, in check. You're not, you know, you're not going to. Okay. So, so I would say taking the go around out of it, this is, you know, from my perspective, this is all about getting slow. You know, the, what we really want to teach pilots is to avoid getting slow, period. I agree. They need to see what happens when they do get slow. And so somehow we need to demonstrate that. Uh, but I you're, think talking about a, you're talking about an asymmetric power stall. Are you saying that we should demonstrate that? Absolutely not. <laughs> I, I think we need to have them understand what happens when they get slow. And you can do that at a higher speed. But you need to demonstrate what happens. And like I mentioned, we can limit the rudder travel. We can just say, let's pretend you're out of rudder travel. You got no more. Slow down a little bit and watch how the nose goes off to the side. You've demonstrated it. You give them an understanding that eventually you can run out of that kind of uh, leverage with your rudder, but you don't need to go down to a uh, stall speed to do it. This is great. And we're really getting somewhere. Okay. So 
uh, because you're talking about a VMC demo and what you're suggesting problem that the pilot encounters is a VMC problem. Uh, and what I'm suggesting is that the problem that the pilot encounters is not VMC so much as it is asymmetric power stall. And we don't show pilots what happens when they get to an asymmetric power stall. And the reason we don't show that is because we don't want to be involved in a fatal training accident. And so a pilot gets to thinking that VMC is the problem, but it's not. Asymmetric power stall is the problem. It results in a complete, total loss of control of the airplane as the airplane rolls over on its back and pitches downward. And if that happens, you know, like I said with, with uh, my friend Brian Moore, uh, it took him 3,500 feet to regain control of the airplane when that happens. Okay, and so this is what's going on as pilots are trained to get slow because we wanna teach VMC, but VMC is not the problem. The problem is asymmetric power stall and it's waiting for you when you get slow enough. It's waiting for any pilot when you get slow enough and it's gonna result in a loss of control and that loss of control is likely to result in a fatal accident. You know, my postulation originally was that pilots do what they're trained to do primacy, recency, frequency. And if you teach a pilot to get slow as part of a VMC demo, and you do that over and over again, they're gonna to come to the conclusion that it's okay to get slow. And I don't want the revolvers going off, so I never want the pilot to get slow. So there's some minimum speed, you know, you can call it blue line airspeed or VXSE, that I want the pilot to maintain at all times with a windmill propeller. And if they get slow, even slightly slow, even two knots slow, then I administer a consequence actually when I'm training pilots. In the simulator, I use a rubber band and I get, per, I, I get uh, permission in advance to do this. But if they get a little slow, I, I thwap them with that rubber band. Man, it hurts, it stings, but not nearly so much as a fatal accident. And so only a couple thwaps with the rubber band and guess what? They stop getting slow because they don't like the pain. In an airplane, I use a pin, a, a straight pin. I get, again, permission from the pilot to do this, and I explain why. And I said, I'm conditioning you to never get slow with an engine out. There's no operational advantage. And the slower you get, the closer you come to the point where the tri trigger gets pulled and the airplane becomes un uh, uncontrollable. So there's no operational advantage to getting slow. There's potential fatal accident from getting slow. Uh, and so the huge lesson here is don't get slow. And the problem with a VMC demo is that over and over again, generally in multi-engine training, the pilot is being taught to get slow with a windmilling propeller. And that in my mind is unacceptable behavior. I think, you know, my, my instructor who I affectionately refer to as, as dad, didn't use a rubber band, but he used a rolled up sectional in the back of the Satabri and whacked me on the head with it at certain times. And that was my correction <laughs> for certain things. And I still sometimes feel that whack in the head when I'm flying by myself. But I think it's a very good point about maintaining and respecting the airspeed as if a low speed is going to kill you and be afraid of it. I, I think that's very important. We need to respect also right now and I think what you're talking about is a change in the ACS, but right now we have requirements that we have to teach and the pilots have to be tested on. And, and that is what the FAA recommends and what they dictate that we have to do in the ACS. And I think that what you're saying, if I'm hearing you correctly, Nick, is that that should change and we should never get close to the extreme. And I think Gary also agreed to that. And he was alluding to it by never teaching approaching red line on the top end. Why do we teach approaching red line on the bottom end? I think we need to teach the edges of performance, but we need to practice staying in the middle and not getting near the edge at, at any point. So we can do that without actually going to the edge, but it needs to be taught. Am I correct in what I'm hearing? Well, I guess I would say that uh, what needs to be taught is if you get slow, the airplane is gonna become uncontrollable. And it doesn't matter whether it's VMC or whether it's uh, asymmetric power stall, but if we associate uncontrollable with a loss of control, fatal accident, you know, then, then we can come back and say, okay, we don't want to do this. You know, we really don't want to teach people to put the airplane in a situation 
that is likely to, re to result in a loss of control accident. And that's exactly what we're doing with VMC demos. I'm of the opinion that the VMC demo should be eliminated entirely. I can tell you, when I first started training multi-engine pilots intensively as an instructor for the Beach Factory, and I was doing mostly Barons and Dukes, that my experience was that pilots got slow a lot uh, and ultimately lost control of the airplane. And this was mostly in the simulator. I had a, uh, had a sim that I was using that flight safety built for me. Uh, so I've done multi-engine training for maybe 300 pilots in a simulator. Uh, and I watched them over and over again lose control. And the reason for the loss of control was almost always getting slow. So I eliminated VMC demos from the, uh, from the Beach Factory flight safety curriculum and said, we're gonna teach you not VMC demos, we're gonna teach you to never get slow. If you get slow, it's gonna hurt. And lo and behold, the pilots who were trained to maintain an airspeed at which the airplane was controllable, maintained control. You could give them the engine out in any phase, in any condition of flight, and they maintained control of the aircraft because they didn't get slow. So why the heck are we teaching pilots over and over and over again, VMC demos where we're teaching the pilot to get slow, get to the point where the switch is almost flipped and then we recover. I guess if I were, if I were going to look at, at uh, a different thing that we train, let's call it crosswind takeoffs. Let's suppose we get a 10 knot crosswind from the left and we taxi out onto the runway. What do we tell the pilot? You know, put aileron into the wind, okay? And we always tell the pilot to put aileron into the wind. We don't really tell the pilot, hey, now what I want you to do here is I want you to put aileron away from the wind and we're gonna take off. And when you take off, the left wing is gonna pop up first and the airplane is gonna make a 30 or 40 degree heading change almost immediately. But just before you hit that Q400 on the parallel taxiway, you're going to apply the appropriate controls to recover from this nearly uncontrollable situation. And what would you say to that as an instructor? You'd say, no, heck no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm going to insist that the pilot do the right thing and put the ailerons into the wind on a crosswind takeoff. Thoughts on that? I'm in agreement. I think you're teaching a law of primacy and you don't want to teach the wrong way to do it, nor do you want to take unnecessary risks to do so. I'm, I'm in agreement with that. I, I, I think that you, you, you make a fair case on not teaching something that is right on the edge of danger. I think what we need to do, however, is find a way to instill a respect and understanding for what happens with VMC without actually having to go all the way to the edge and doing it. And that's, I think that's what I started doing when I started teaching the way that I described earlier, uh, by limiting the rudder travel, by maintaining a healthy respect for the airspeed uh, at the same time. And I think that, but right now, what, we, what I agree with you guys, we have a problem in our ACS. We have to teach what is going to happen on the check ride. And, and, and with that, I'm in agreement with you. Okay, great. So uh, that's terrific. Gary, your thoughts on this? Well, just because I like to throw grenades and run, here's my first one. Uh, I would like to require an asymmetric stall demo for every multi-engine check ride and as part of every training, but I'd like to do an asymmetric stall demo on takeoff. I'd like to do an asymmetric stall demo on a go around. And I'd like to do an, AM, uh, an asymmetric stall demo in flight while people try and struggle to maintain altitude. My requirement, and this is gonna be the controversial, I'm gonna throw the grenade and run, is that all multi-engine students are required to do some simulator time, which is the only safe way to do all the bad things. So if we, if we never show people a spin, they have no chance of recovering from a spin. We can teach them not to get slow enough. We can teach them to recover at the stall warning horn. I'd still like people to see a spin in real life. So I'd like all multi-engine pilots at least once a year if we can, or once every 24 months, and to pass a check ride to undergo asymmetric stalls in simulators. 
So I'm the you guy know, sitting a here. lot of extra expense that, but I'm okay. Yeah. When I watch those lawyer shows on TV, I watch the one side make their case and I'm like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. There's no way this, they, they got this one. And then the other side presents their case and I go, oh yeah, mm-hmm, yeah, that side's got to win now. And, and I'm kind of like that right between you guys right now because I would like to take another grenade out of your bucket of grenades, Gary, and throw it with you because I totally agree with that. And then, Nick, at the same time, I'm hearing you say, we don't want to teach this law of primacy to have them do these things because they are going to revert to that when, when the, uh, uh, you know, what hits the fan, that's what you revert to. You revert to your law, you know, your muscle memory, what you've been taught, what you do, and, and uh, uh, the, the startle factor kicks in. So I'm torn in between those two philosophies. I think it needs to be seen in the simulator. And I think it's true that insurance companies are driving a lot of what happens, but I also know some uh, multi-engine pilots who are very wealthy and they self-insure and they don't, they don't worry about what insurance, and they don't have to have insurance. And so the FAA, I believe, needs to step in and, and govern some of this, and maybe we should uh, create some kind of group to, to, to do this in a safe way and come up with a compromise. Well, uh, and, but, and gentlemen, that's the perfect segue to all of this. I mean, you've talked about a lot of different uh, uh, opinions and, and controversial ideas. And, and we've always said, and this is why we're doing it, that controversial ideas are, are okay. It's, it's okay for people to agree. It's okay for people to disagree. But how do you push that rock forward? Well, you push the rock by talking about it, right? Um, so if we're talking about the possibility of making some of these changes, where's the middle ground? Like, what do you propose we do if we were to make these changes? What, what would we go to the FAA and say, Hey, it'd be a really good idea if we did X. Well, what's X? Well, I, I think, uh, the answer for my, my simulator idea is to get an ATP now you have to experience simulator time. What was the resistance to doing a certain amount of simulator hours before you could get an ATP? And I think the resistance that always pops up is the cost, mm -hmm. you know? Well, but if I, if I have to go to a company and spend however many hours it is in a simulator to get an ATP now, well, that's an extra four or $5,000. I feel their pain. That's real money. That's real money to me. The question is, is what is the cost of requiring all multi-engine students to go through the worst of the worst in a simulator versus the cost of continuing fatal accidents? Yeah, if you were just in a fatal accident and you could pause, rewind 10 seconds and say, okay, we can undo this. If you spend $5,000 and go do simulator training, then this wouldn't have happened. Would you pay that 5,000 at that point? Absolutely, and the I insurance would. rates would fall. I, I know the insurance rates will go down if we reduce the fatal accidents. So spending four or five grand for simulator training before your multi-engine check ride and every, let's say 24 months, I'd prefer 12, but let's say every 24 months, if you're saving that much money on insurance every year and you're not dying, I think that's a win. I think it's a good investment. So I guess I would say I'm a, I'm a huge simulator fan. I've probably got, you know, 5,000 hours of training pilots using simulation. I'm not sure that a simulator is absolutely necessary to accomplish what we want to accomplish. You know, because a pilot can be taught to, to operate the airplane in any phase of flight and maintain control of the aircraft and not get slow without using a simulator. But let's suppose that the, uh, the, the standards for the test required that the pilot demonstrate an engine out emergency procedure in every phase of flight on the takeoff roll, after liftoff with the gear down, after liftoff with the gear and transit are up, during climb, during cruise, during descent, level off at MDA on a circling approach, on the glide path, on a precision approach, initiating a, a balk landing go around, initially initiating a missed approach. Pilot has to demonstrate an engine out emergency in all those phases of flight. And you would say, uh, yeah, that sounds really good. Um, 
And not only should it be all those phases of flight, but it should be an IMC or simulated IMC. And it should be at night. And it should be with the autopilot coupled at least half the time because most pilots flying twins fly with the autopilot on probably 70 to 80% of the time. So I'll ask you, you know, you get a lot of VMC demos. How many pilots do you know who have gone through multi-engine training and had to master an engine out while flying a precision approach halfway down the glide path in the clouds at night? How many? None. So why is it that we do all these VMC demos, but we can't seem to bring ourselves to teach a pilot to do an engine out emergency with the autopilot coupled on an approach in IMC at night or any combination of those things? Well, I, I think like I'm all in favor of your idea. So, so don't get me wrong. I think then it becomes cumbersome, which is, is not a good reason not to do it, but how many demos are legislated on the check ride? How many demos are legislated uh, by the MEI? So how many, how many demos in all phases of the fight? Like I'm with you, they should be capable of doing all that. That's why I'm a fan of simulators. But in the real airplane, how many demos on one check ride can we logistically do before decision fatigue and workload kind of cancels out the benefits? Okay, that's a really good question from my perspective. So I guess I would say, first of all, that we're talking about training pilots and not necessarily just passing a check ride because there's a huge difference. I can tell you that when I got my multi-engine certification, I had six hours in a multi-engine airplane and I passed the check ride and I had no business flying that airplane as, as pilot command. I had passed a check ride in accordance with the minimum standards, but I was nowhere near mastery. And so if I wanna talk about mastery and not minimums, you know, then really what I'm talking about is being able to deal competently with an engine out in all phases of flight, in all conditions of flight. And there are ways to arrange a training program to yield ex exactly that. So I think pilots can be trained to competence in all of those situations. I know it can be done, I've done it. I agree with you, no. Nick. I think that anyway. I think this, this needs to be taken care of in the training phase, not the checking. In the checking phase, you're only checking little portions of a sampling of all the skills. There's no way on a check ride you could check everything that a pilot needs to know uh, or the skills that they need to have. It's only a sampling. And as far as the requirement, it needs to be done in training and the instructor needs to take care of it and the program needs to cover what needs to be covered. The check ride is just to take a sample of each of those phases and see if, if, if those, like a written test, there's like a bank of what, 6,000 questions, but you're only gonna get 60. Uh, you can't test everything. It's on the train. It has to happen in training. Well, and as as Jason Shepard says, the ACS is the utmost worst you can do and still become a pilot. <laughs> Fair point. I like that. So, so back to Gary's point, I think is that you know, we're we're really not training to the check ride. That's not the goal of this. You know, we're training for pilot proficiency. Uh, and I guess I would say with regard to also what Gary said is that a simulator is the best tool for doing that. And I've trained a lot of Baron pilots in simulators and aircraft in the same week. Uh, and generally we spent twice as much time in the sim as we did in the airplane. Uh, and I guess I would say that I, I love simulator training. I'm a big fan. There are ways to accomplish the same things using an airplane but it takes two to three times as long to do it. So the SIM is uh, an efficiency tool, it's a safety tool, it's a cost reduction tool. Uh, and for those reasons, I'm very much in favor of the simulator. And you know, the risk reduction all by itself is worth using a simulator. So okay. there are pe people will tell you, you know, there's things that you just shouldn't do in an airplane. And I agree. 
you know, pulling an engine right off the deck when the airplane has just taken off with the landing gear down is a bad idea. Yeah, and I, I probably have a tie with you in hours of dual given in simulators, and I agree with what you're saying. There are things like, for example, in instrument training, you can cover an instrument and say that failed in an airplane. Or you can fail the vacuum pump in a simulator, and it's going to incipiently spin down the gyros without a flag, and the student has to figure out, okay, what happened here? These instruments aren't agreeing. And you can do that in a simulator where it's not so easy to do in an airplane. Same with multi-engine, and you can do things that would be too risky to do in an airplane. I, I'm, I'm in agreement. I think that the simulator training should be required, I'm, so I agree with Gary on that. Um, and I believe there is a way to do it. So I, I think in general we're all kind of agreeing with each other. And maybe we need to try to figure out what the next step is to try to get the multi-engine training uh, the way it should be. So, Brian and John and Nick, so instead of working on the ACS first, instead of getting what's tested first, do we actually need to amend the FARs, what's required during multi-engine training? Just like there are requirements during private pilot training, you know, you got to do a cross country, you got to do so much this, so much that. Do we need to start looking at amending the FARs to require single engine demos in all phases of flight, some to be accomplished in a simulator and some to be accomplished in an airplane? And maybe more importantly than that is that we start that out in the multi-engine instructor programs because so many really good instructors have very little multi-engine time, are they necessarily gonna be great at or comfortable doing single engine in all phases of flight? So do we need to start with the instructors? Do we need to start with ACS? Do we need to start with the FARs? Where do you think we should start? I've always been an advocate of not adding any more regulation. Uh, in the case of multi-engine flying and the accidents that we're seeing, it almost needs to happen. Something has to happen. I think we need to start with the, the instrument, with the multi right about that, uh, because that's the foundation of what's being taught. But I believe a program needs to be developed, and I think as long as the publication says we're teaching, we have to do a VMC demo on the check ride, then we have to teach it. Uh, we have to adhere to that. So I think what we need to do is change that which we are supposed to adhere to. So I think that needs to change first uh, at the ACS uh, and, and the, the training program. And, and, and I, I think the uh, down the line would be the regulations. So my grenade is the VMC demo is counterproductive, a huge waste of time, and even worse than that, because it teach a pi teaches a pilot to do something they should never do in the airplane and that is get slow. And I'm all for VMC recoveries as long as the airplane never gets slow. So. And I can't disagree with that. I believe there's a way to do it, to teach the, the, the student a respect for how, what, how they can run out of rudder, how it can happen. You don't need to get slow to do it. And, and, and I think it's just for the multi-engine instructors listening, if especially if you're kind of a new MEI, uh, you know, obviously, thanks for being part of NAFI and, and tuning into these things. You know, you can limit the rudder just by sticking your foot out, you know. You can physically block the rudder from moving for your student, as Brian said, at a safe airspeed. So if VMC is 75, you know, you physically block the rudder from moving at 90. And this is what it feels like, and you see how you're losing control. And yeah. then if we followed that up with an asymmetric stall demo in the sim, I, I think that combination would work really well. I agree. And I used to put my foot behind the rudder pedal. Don't ever do that. <laughs> no, no, just push on I the got, other rudder pedal. It's, yeah, it's push on both at the same time and lock them where they are as a technique. <laughs> So guys, I think that, uh, um, you know, certainly this is a, a very large topic and, and probably considered a hot button topic. And I think there's probably another several hours worth of discussion that we could have as to, uh, you know, what this means, what kind of changes we could do and solutions that might be provided. And I think that's probably a great topic for a follow-up video here. 
Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, um, it's, like I said before, definitely an interesting discussion, a controversial one, um, but that's okay, right? We, it, it'll be interesting to see what people who are watching this video or listening to it in other forums think. You know, we'd love to know what the ideas are of the instructor community because we're just four people, right? Um, you know, we want the, the industry to be as safe as possible. We want our pilot candidates to be as safe as possible. And we want to obviously train to be as safe as possible. So how we get there um, is really what the meat and potatoes of all this discussion is. Um, and certainly, I mean, the, the views that you all three expressed, I, I feel compelled to say, are those of you guys. Um, you know, Nafi's just providing the platform here. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, that's what we feel strongly about. We want our members and our instructors to be able to share ideas and communicate in this way. Now, I'm going to throw this back out to you. We'll start with Gary. Any final thoughts on this topic before we call it quits today? You know, the only thing I, I didn't bring up is that I'd really like to encourage flight instructors that don't have time in a particular airplane or very limited time in a particular airplane to refer flight reviews and multi-engine training in planes they don't have ex a lot of experience in to other instructors. Mm -hmm. um, being the, the, the guy or the gal that takes every client because that's how you get experience. I, I, I would encourage somebody, if you've never flown for my example, the Cessna Crusader, refer that student out who wants a flight review to a Crusader experience instructor, but ask to go along and even ask to do one or two flights with that instructor. You know, don't be afraid to refer a student to somebody who's more qualified for safety and gain experience that way. And there are a number of ways you can find online instructors who are specializing on certain airplanes. Absolutely. Brian, final thoughts. My final piece of advice would be not to be the pilot who, after getting a multi-engine rating, never goes out and does multi-engine training again and, and tries to avoid it, like I alluded to earlier in the video. Please go out and, and obtain a regular recurrent training in, in engine out procedures, whether it be in a simulator or in an airplane, but get, find an experienced instructor qualified in your type airplane and get that engine out training regularly. So I please, please, please go out and get regular recurrent training in engine out procedures. Now, Nick, I really appreciate your willingness today to, to put yourself in the hot seat. Um, you know, it's it's a, a great conversation to have. And, and uh, you know, I, I appreciate that uh, that you're willing to be the focus of, of that conversation. So thank you so much. Um, and any final thoughts from you? Uh, thanks, John. I, I, my final thoughts are two, twofold. One for instructors, which is uh, teach the pilots that you're training in multi-engine emergencies don't get slow. Don't get slow. Don't get slow because you're, you're, you're compounding the possibility that you're going to lose control of the airplane and have a fatal accident. Uh, and the second thing is if you're a multi-engine instructor, be really careful when you're training high risk engine out emergency procedures. A simulator is a place to do that. Uh, there are some things that you shouldn't try in an airplane uh, and keep that in mind. So, don't get slow and don't do dumb stuff in an airplane. That's it. <laughs> well, folks, the single uh, largest quality that I admire in, in all of you and, and our NAFI members is that you care. Uh, these discussions don't happen with instructors who don't care. So I, I commend you all for, for that and, and for the passion that you've put into this conversation. I imagine we're going to be having some more. Um, so thank you so much for joining and uh, everyone out there, be careful. 